My name is Dallas Willard, and my work is to teach the teachings of Christ and to live them. If you want to change, whether it's uh, stopping smoking or saving money or losing weight or whatever, you have to be specific. And you have to take specific steps towards the end. And there's almost nothing that cannot be changed, especially in the area of grace, uh, if you just be specific and learn as you go, and then you can do it. But we don't have that teaching, unfortunately. And maybe we will now that we have Manvi on the job. We have cultivated an understanding of the devotional life uh, which leaves life out of it. Ah. Right? So we have a devotional life, but we don't have a life of devotion. Right? Uh, we have a prayer life, not much, but a little one. But what we need is a praying life. And that's where real spiritual growth, because it puts us in touch with reality. And when Jesus uh, said, uh, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples in it, he meant you're putting it into practice. Now, think of your church as a place where that's what's going on, is people are learning how to put into practice the things that Jesus said. And once you do that, then of course you're talking about whole life because you're not going to just do that on Sunday. Sunday will be sort of where you come back to gather with those who love you, and uh, you encourage one another, teach one another, help one another, and to form a, a community of love like that is a, as a group of disciples is what you need in the way of a church. And then, of course, in that context, you need teaching and preaching and arranging for things and uh, uh, taking some of the teachings of Jesus, for example, and saying, now we're going to devote six weeks to learning this. Who wants to go with us? Well, spiritual growth doesn't respond well to guilt, period. Uh, what we have learned to do is to try to motivate people by guilt. But guilt is not constructive because it is always something that has a negative uh, impact on the individual. So what they come out knowing is, I ought to do this, I ought to do that, I ought to do the other but it doesn't help them find out how. <laughs> and uh, a major part of that is, uh, is finding out why it's a good thing to do these things. And uh, once you understand that, like uh, most people understand, for example, why it's a good thing to share with your friends and neighbors where a good deal in stocks or refrigerators or things of that sort, they don't have a problem with this. Uh, and it's because they see this as an act of friendship and love. And so for something like witnessing, where there's huge guilt over this, um, uh, the real problem is to know why it's a good thing. And as uh, St. Augustine said many uh, centuries ago, we, we want, to want people to know because we love them. And now once you understand that, then you've got a positive motivation. Same way with giving. Uh, giving is a primary step in life in the kingdom of God, but most people don't know that. Uh, they don't understand that it is participating in what God is doing for good uh, in their surroundings, not church, but not just church. And for that matter, why is it good for the church? I mean, uh, that then gets you into the positive issue of what is the value of there being a church, as we use that language. And what is the value of there being a church? Well, primarily, it is to form a community of love where all the bad habits that we gain in a world apart from God are broken, mm -hmm. 
and we are convinced that we can trust love. Um, and that's one reason why our churches don't always run smoothly, is so we can find out that you can, <laughs> and you don't have to um, fall back into all the devices that we have when we are uh, running through the bushes of wild on our own, trying to make a life like Cain. <laughs> So that, that's basically what it's for, and the effect of that is to make disciples and to grow disciples. And this is where the good teaching needs to come in, uh, that will help people get past all of these guilt points and do things in an appropriate way because they're good to do. Conviction of sin is not just guilt. Uh, it is a, a kind of vision of change. Mm -hmm. And I think confession really is important in it because confession is is very like the point at which you abandon yourself to God. And when you study the history of revivals and of the lives of people, you see it plays a huge role. But it isn't just guilt. It isn't a sense, oh, I'm worthless or I'm terrible or something of that sort. Uh, it's it's uh, there's a different world, and repentance is the proclamation of that for yourself, and you enter into it. And then there is a different world, and that's where the side of spirituality takes over, is when that begins to move in you, after you have abandoned yourself to God. And I think that's always a matter of degree. I think like when I was nine years old, I, I abandoned myself to God, but I didn't know much. And then as I grew, then I made choices, many of them wrong, and uh, so I, I had to learn more about abandonment to God. And I think that when you come into ministry, especially as a Christian, I don't just mean preachers like you and me, but uh, you, you now see your life as a ministry, uh, then you're going to come to know more and more about what it is to be abandoned to God. So the presence of God, to me, is something that uh, is to be counted on and expected. And so when I'm preaching or teaching or writing or whatever, that's what I'm counting on. And um, uh, it seems like Simply put, it works. But it's not something that I just talk about. It is real presence, and I can see it and know it working. Well, redemption means to buy us back from the position we have fallen to in rejecting the, sup the supremacy of God in our lives. And uh, so the total process is one of restoring us to God's intention for us in creation. And that basically is that under him we should live uh, as people who are creative of good under him, by his power actually. And that's why we don't want to be cut off from him. And the way that redemption takes place is through God coming to us uh, in history and above all, of course, in the incarnation of his Son, uh, Jesus Christ. So the full story of redemption is the story of incarnation. And in the process of incarnation, there are many things that Jesus does. One is he establishes his place in ordinary human history by being born and raised and living as a, a businessman or an independent contractor, if you wish, and uh, then as a rabbi, uh, a teacher, and finally by his death on the cross and his resurrection beyond death. All of that goes into redemption. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ be not risen, you are, your faith is in vain, you are still in your sins. 
You see, that's the whole picture of Jesus now coming into history, dying on our behalf in our place. He did that. And then rising again and allowing us to live resurrection life by our relationship to him. And that's more or less the full story on redemption. And the Bible doesn't begin in Genesis 3. The fall of man is not the beginning of history. It begins with the story of God, to speak generally, God deciding to make human beings. And that's Genesis 1, 26. And of course he's done a great deal before that. Uh, so you have to start with creation if you're going to make sense of redemption. Uh, because it is creation, as expressed in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image or likeness and let him have responsibility. And the first thing you're given responsibility over is fish of all things. You get creeping things and all sorts of that's but see, that's, human beings have lived on the back of animals ever since they got here. And uh, so that's natural. And by the time you get to Psalm 8, you've moved up to domesticated animals. You start with sheep there, not fish. What would you start with today? Well, most people haven't, had, haven't actually seen a sheep for a long time. <laughs> so the question is, what are we responsible for? And... Uh, that is what we're called to do, is to be responsible for the earth under God. And, of course, that moves right into living under God, because we never expected to do that on our own. And it was mistrust of God that caused our problems. Now then we can come to Genesis 3. Dominion primarily means governance. It means to have, in other words, a kingdom. And every human person uh, has a kingdom. And to be responsible to it, they have to live under God. And the great temptation is to step out of that and have a kingdom of your own. And so the great threat to God's kingdom in my life is my kingdom. And, uh, and of course everyone else has one of theirs. And that's where the terrible story of human life uh, steps forward. All of the suffering and failure, the horrible things that you can hardly stand to think of that go on all the time around the world. It's because uh, of individuals hoping to get what they want and putting that as supreme instead of subjecting their kingdoms to God's kingdom. But dominion is built into the human being. It, is, it can't be eradicated, and it's not bad, except when it is not under God. And then when it's not under God, it's an insolvable problem. And the uh, issue of who will have dominion becomes deadly, breaks out in wars, international relations, politically enforced famines, broken homes, children with no one to take care of them, all these terrible things come out of human dominion apart from God. And we have to understand that as responsibility for good under God. And then we've got dominion right. Well, uh, Jesus' message was, repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. And how it changes you uh, is you learn to trust Jesus Christ and live in his kingdom and that means to bring your whole life and everything you do into a position of dependence on him and of course the issue of forgiveness of sins has to be dealt with and that's taken care of by him uh, in his life and his death and his resurrection that's the whole story because the, the, the real test of your understanding of redemption is what does it have to do with life? Not just what does it have to do with death, but life. And the picture of the New Testament is that salvation is eternal life. And that's not something that starts after you die. It's, eternity has been running for quite some time, 
and now we get to take our life into that here and now. That's a learning process that occurs as we are disciples of Jesus. We learn more and more how to do that. See, if the death of Christ were the only thing involved in atonement, that could have been taken care of in the Garden of Eden. Christ could have died on the spot, but he didn't. And a long and painful process of history was necessary before he came. In the fullness of time, he came. And what he did was tied to the fullness of time in God's plan of human history and eternity. So that's what we have to see to understand. And it'll help us to remember that Jesus is the redemption. Our relationship to him is what redeems us. That's one of faith and trust for life as a whole.